back at it again with the Mobius Dickus, Chapter 42, The Whiteness of the Whale. Ooh, I've been waiting for this one. It's a good one. It's a wonderful one. So this chapter is probably by far the most well-known chapter of Moby Dick. I think it is by far the best chapter of Moby Dick. It is the most interesting. Um, there are many competitors, but this one's really at the top for me. So what is investigated in chapter 42 is whether meaning is inherent or contingent. So I guess that deserves a little bit of discussion before we launch into things. So the belief that meaning is inherent would be to say that before human beings think about something, that that thing could have meaning. So let's say I am driving through the woods and I see a tree. If I think that the meaning or importance of the tree is inherent, I would say that that tree has a purpose or a goal or was made with some intentionality behind it beyond the mechanical laws of the universe. So maybe a god created that tree or perhaps some other being that I don't know created that tree or uh, I could say that the laws of nature are the ways that God operates. So even if God didn't necessarily plant that tree himself in those seven days that Genesis talks about, if the laws of nature and the laws of the universe were created by God, then I could still see there being some type of intentionality to why that tree was created, in which case that tree has inherent meaning because it is a product of God's creation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas, if I think that meaning is contingent, or the importance of something is contingent, or the essence of something is contingent, then what that means is that it would follow human thought. So, I look at the tree and I say, well, the meaning of this tree is to cut down and make paper with. Now, it would be pretty absurd, I don't know of any mythological or religious traditions that argue that the inherent meaning of trees, like the reason they were created, is to make paper. Whereas, that shouldn't bother someone who is comfortable operating within a framework of contingent meaning because they could simply say, uh, yeah, I know, like, no one said this tree was here to make paper, but I can make paper with it, and I decide, using my own choice, that this is how I think the meaning of the tree should go. This is a rather obvious and simple example, which becomes a lot more complex when you start to use a question like, what is the purpose or meaning of a human being? Do human beings have certain true concepts that determine what the good life is before human beings think about it? Let's take the simple example of killing someone. Is killing someone wrong regardless of what someone thinks about it? Or is killing someone wrong simply because a lot of people have gotten together and decided that it's wrong? Well, there would be two perspectives, right? Like you could have an essentialist notion that says, well, I believe that God intended the actions of human beings to have the meaning of maximizing love for other people. Murder is against love. And in fact, God has made this disapproval rather explicit in the Ten Commandments. Therefore, uh, therefore, murder is wrong, regardless of whether you agree or not, right? That would be an inherent interpretation of murder. Whereas a contingent interpretation of murder and its meaning would say, well, people have talked about the implications of murder and we've fit it into our moral system and it just doesn't make sense. So we're going to outlaw it and say that it's wrong, but that's a decision we've made. Theoretically, that contingent justification could obviously justify the other way. You could say, well, we've thought about it and uh, we've decided murder is correct. <laughs> It's not about what the decision is. It's about how the decision is made, right? Uh, do things have meanings before humans deliberate about them? Or do human beings give meaning to things? This is an interesting question. It's been asked for a long, long time. And chapter 42 does a pretty darn thorough job of seemingly undermining the notion that meaning is inherent. This is certainly a chapter which seems to set out to destabilize the notion of meaning being inherent. Uh, let's see how the chapter does that. 
obviously, given the title, the mechanism through which it will engage in that conversation is going to be a discussion of whether the color white has inherent characteristics. Now, throughout this chapter, you sh we're going to be talking about what the whale means or what the whiteness of the whale means. So you should be reading the treatment of the color white as essentially the treatment of the question of meaning itself. If the color white is inherent and has certain significance and importance, that would be like the interpretation, God says murder is wrong, it doesn't matter what human beings say, right? White means certain things because it means certain things, just is what it is. Whereas, if white and the color white has lots of different separate meanings, then that seems to challenge the notion that white itself has inherent meaning, but rather people have just come up with different meanings. Of course, uh, we can immediately jump in here where the first thing that Melville does is he seemingly starts out on a path to confirm the truth value of inherent meaning or the truth validity of human, of uh, inherent meaning when he starts listing examples of a pattern emerging where whiteness is always good, right? And it would seem that if you have this huge pattern of whiteness being good, then that would seem to be pretty good evidence that maybe it, there's just something about white that it's always good. It's just inherently good, right? And so let's look at his examples. I, if you've already read them, feel free to skip forward till I till I move to a different passage. But you know, I just love the examples, and in case you haven't read them, I want to go over them because they're so interestingly multicultural right this would be a bad argument if melville was only talking about a few examples but really the prolific attitude of cataloging things which we see throughout moby dick really gets leveraged i think to melville's advantage here so let's look at his examples of whiteness being good where he introduces this possibility of meaning being inherent so whiteness refiningly enhances beauty as if imparting some special virtue of its own. That's a great phrase to summarize the notion of inherent meaning. Things have a special virtue of its own. As in marbles, haponicas, which is a, like a flower, I think, a camellia. Yeah. And pearls. Though various nations have in some way recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric grand old kings of Pegu, placing the title, let's see, Pegu, a city in southern Burma, placing the title Lord of the White Elephants above all other in their magniloquent ascriptions of dominion. What a phrase. Uh, and the modern kings of Siam, which is another archaic term for Thailand, uh, unfurling the same snow white quadrupled in the royal standard and the Hanover hanoverian flag uh bearing the one figure sorry just let me turn the page here of a snow white charger so let's just slow down and talk about those references so obviously the burmese one is kind of self-explanatory apparently there's a title for lower the white elephants hanover hanoverian sorry i always mispronounce that deals with the family that's ruled britain uh from 1714 to 1901 and it has a white horse on the flag uh, yep and let's see and the great austrian empire sees caesarian heir to overlording rome having the imperial color the same imperial hue and though this preeminent oh god let's stop there okay so first what we're referring to here is the flag of the austrian empire but that's not exactly correct the flag of the austrian empire was black and gold uh, i assume he was talking about some flag of austria that preceded its empire but rather unimportant okay and now we get a little racist Again, I don't think Melville is racist, but I do think he's making a racist point to m demonstrate his argument. And we know that this is not racist because even though I think it is racist in and of itself to say what he's about to say, he will contradict this logic immediately in the same chapter when he demonstrates that white does not always mean this. But for now, he says, 
And though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though besides all this whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day. He's talking about uh, Roman calendars uh, were often carved in stone with white stones marking lucky days. Okay. And though in other mortal sympathies and symbolizing, this same hue is made the emblem of many touching noble things, the innocence of brides, so brides wear white wedding dresses, um, the benign benignity of age, and though among the red men of America, the giving of the white belt of wampum uh, was the deepest pledge of honor, wampum being beads that are used from quahog clamshells, which are generally white. Okay, uh, let's see where we leave off. Though in many climes, whiteness typifies the majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge, ermine of the judge being a, a coat that has white on it that the judge would wear in Britain and actually in the United States before 1800. Uh, they, they were red robes with white fur on them and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk white steeds. Uh, and though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions, it has been made the symbol of the divine spotlessness and power by the Persian fire worshipers. Uh, he's, that's like a weird orientalist reference to Zoroastrianism, the white forked flame being held the holiest on the altar, and in Greek mythology's great Jove himself made be, himself being made incarnate in a snow white bull. Okay, so oftentimes when Zeus would uh, make himself physical, he would make himself a white bull. Uh, and though to the noble Iroquois, the midwinter sacrifice of the sacred white dog was by far the holiest festival of their theology, that spotless faithful creature being held the purest envoy they could send to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own fidelity, and though directly from the Latin word for white, which is albus, uh, we get all Christian priests derive the name of one part of their sacred vesture, the alb or tunic, uh, worn beneath the cassock. And though among the holy pomps of the Romish faith, white is specially employed in the celebration of the Passion of our Lord, so we, we decorate with white during that, though in the vision of St. John, which is a reference to the book of Revelation, which is written by a guy named St. John of Patmos, white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four and twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the holy one that sitteth there, white like wool. Okay, so like I said, I, I find it fun to go through those references. Is that essential? Perhaps not. But uh, I do find it fun and interesting and pretty impressive, honestly, for a guy writing in 1851 when multicultural exchange is nothing like what it was now. But like I said, what's the thematic importance here? Well, this would be a pretty good argument that white has some inherent characteristic and therefore figuratively that meaning can be inherent as opposed to contingent. Maybe white means something beyond just what human beings decide white means, right? But of course, we're immediately going to go into the examples which start to shake our confidence in the possibility of inherent meaning once Melville starts talking about all the cases where whiteness is not so positive. This elusive quality it is which causes the thought of whiteness when divorced from more kindly associations and coupled with any object terrible in itself to heighten the terror to the furthest bounds. In the first example he gives, classic, though Coca-Cola has tried to change it, Witness the white bear of the poles, then the white shark of the tropics. What but their smooth, flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent horrors they are? So he's sharks and polar bears are his first two arguments. That ghastly whiteness it is which imparts such an abhorrent mildness even more loathsome than terrific to the dumb gloating of their aspect. Okay. Uh, so that not the fierce fang tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white shrouded bear or shark. Bethink thee of the albatross, whence come those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations? Not Coleridge first through that spell, but God's great unflattering laureate nature. Okay, so this requires a little explanation. The albatross is a very large uh, sea bird that is always stark white, okay? And it has been thought for a long time to symbolize 
the spirits of sailors who had died at sea. Now, Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote a famous, famous poem called The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which involves the story of a sailor ultimately shooting the albatross that he sees and then uh, causing a curse to fall upon his boat because of his um, actions. So here, the albatross would represent a kind of a bad omen, right? So here, at this point in the chapter, we're given a few counterexamples which could shake our confidence in inherent meaning. But, but we're going to continue on, okay? Uh, let's see. <laughs> and now we're going to encounter this example of the white steed of the prairies, which seems to play both sides. So let's read. Famous in our Western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty overscorning car carriage. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds, Xerxes being the king of the Persian Empire. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds of wild horses whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the Rocky Mountains and the Alleghenies. At their flaming head, he westward trooped it like that chosen star which every evening leads on the hosts of light. So if you're curious about that chosen star, that's Venus, uh, which leaves light. So it seems at this point that the white horse is like a super positive image, right? The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished him. So the fact that this is a white horse makes him more resplendent, i.e. Uh, more uh, attractive and impressive than being covered in gold and silver would have done. A most imperial and archangel archangelical apparition of that unfallen western world uh, which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of those primeval times when adam walked majestic as a god bluff bowed and fearless as this mighty steed whether marching amid his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains like in ohio or whether with his circumambient subjects browsing all around the horizon the white steed gallopingly reviewed them with warm nostril, nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness in whatever aspect he presented himself. Always to the bravest Indians he was the object of trembling reverence and awe. Nor can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of this noble horse that it was his spiritual whiteness chiefly which clothed him with divineness, and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship, at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. Okay, so you have two options here. Either A, we read the white horse as being purely positive, which is already problematic because now we're switching back and forth in terms of meanings. This does nothing to refute the counterexamples given of the polar bear and the shark and the albatross. It just says that there are other white things which are good. But that doesn't mean that meaning is inherent. That just means that meaning is contingent and you can play either side. But actually, the white horse discussed here makes that point in and of itself in the last line when Melville says that though the whiteness of this horse made it divine, that whiteness also enforced terror. So perhaps the fact that the white horse is good would mean that meaning is contingent because it can play either side, or the very fact that there is a paradoxical dichotomy within the white horse is sufficient for us to realize that uh, whiteness and meaning are both contingently interpreted. But we're going to continue and get even more counterexamples of where whiteness is not good, but bad, to heighten our understanding of the fact that meaning might be contingent. Melville says, What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? So some albinos are not particularly historically well treated, and Melville uses this as a counterexample to say that whiteness can be interpreted as bad. 
Is it that whiteness which invests him a thing expressed by the name he bears? The albino, as Melville has pointed out, alb is the Latin root for whiteness. The albino is as well made as other men. He has no substantive deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all-pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? And obviously the implication is it should be so because white might be inherently bad, not inherently good, but obviously those two cannot coexist at the same time. Nor in quite other aspects does nature in her least palpable but not the less malicious agencies fail to enlist among her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gauntleted ghost of the southern seas has been denominated the white squall. Okay, so we've actually talked about the white squall in this chapter already when we were in chapter 16, when the boat takes off. Uh, or rather in chapter 22, uh, Merry Christmas. But a squall is a sil sudden violent gust of wind or localized storm bringing rain, snow, or sleet. It also threatened to upend the Pequod in chapter 40. So the southern seas, especially around the Cape of South America down there, uh, are notoriously rough. That's why sailing around the bottom of South America, which I believe is called Cape Horn, I don't want to... Uh, expose my geography ignorance yeah it's cape horn at the bottom of south america is uh i believe right yeah cape horn at the bottom of south america is considered such a dangerous journey which actually led to like you know the desire for the panama canal etc because it was really hard to do right so what melville is pointing out is that we tend to associate the horror of that passage with the white waves as opposed to the other waves nor in some historic instances has the heart of human malice omitted so potent an auxiliary how wildly it heightens the effect of that passage in Froissart when massed in the snowy symbol of their faction, the desperate white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the marketplace. Uh, so if you're curious about that reference, uh, the white hoods of Ghent were a urban like group of people who... They're kind of like a militia or a paramilitary group who uh, killed their own government official who was setting out to arrest them in this medieval historical instance that this guy, Froissart, uh, chronicled because he was a medieval historian. So that's just another instance of whiteness being bad. <laughs> Sorry, rather obscure reference, but... Nor in some things does the common hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness to the supernaturalism of this hue. It cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead, which most appalls the gazer, is the marble pallor lingering there, as if indeed that pallor were much like the badge of consternation in the other world, as of mortal trepidation here. So... The obvious example we were all waiting for Melville to use is, hey, dead bodies are also white. And from that pallor of the dead, we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them. So not only are dead bodies white, but the coverings we use on dead bodies are white. Nor even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms. Okay, so not only are dead bodies and the coverings of dead bodies white, but ghosts are white. All ghosts rising in a milk-white fog. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, another reference to St. John of Patmos in the book of Revelation, rides on his pallid horse. So in Revelation chapter 6, uh, the vision of death is presented as riding a pale horse. Another instance of whiteness being associated with death. Okay, so at this point, I highlighted this yellow passage because it seems that Melville starts to wink at the audience and say, boy, isn't finding out the meaning of something incredibly difficult? When he says, but though without dissent this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it? To analyze it, it would seem impossible. Can we then, by the citation of some of those instances wherein this thing of whiteness, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct associations calculated to impart to it aught fearful, but nevertheless is found to exert over us the same sorcery, however modified, can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? So in classic metacognitive moves by your boy Melville, he throws his own project under the bus 
and says that it's trying to find objective essences or meanings might just be a fool's errand. Maybe all of this listing we just went through is not going to lead us to the answer because obviously meaning can't be inherent if we have contradictory evidence. But of course, that's not going to stop our boy Melville, who's going to continue to give examples of whiteness being used to be negative. Or what is there apart from the traditions of dungeoned warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, that makes the White Tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untraveled American than those other storied structures, its neighbors, the Byward Tower, or even the Bloody? So the Tower of London is a building where political prisoners have been kept in England for a long time, dating way back to Henry VIII. And, but there's actually multiple towers within the Tower of London. Like the Tower of London is like a palace and there are multiple towers and prisoners were kept in each of these towers. But the Byward and the Bloody Towers are equivalent jails, but people remember the White Tower, according to Melville, because it sticks in their brain. And those sublimer towers, now he's using towers metaphorically, the White Mountains of New Hampshire, whence in peculiar moods comes that gigantic ghostliness over the soul at the bare mention of that name, while the thought of Virginia's Blue Ridge is full of a soft, dewy, distant dreamness. So those of you who are familiar with John Denver will know that Virginia contains the Blue Ridge Mountains, and of course the Shenandoah River, all right, but... Melville says that those Blue Ridge Mountains, they conjure a much more positive image than White Mountains. White Mountains scares us. Or why, irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes, does the name of the White Sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the Yellow Sea, which is uh, the sea between mainland China and the Korean Peninsula, lulls us with mortal thoughts of long, lacquered, mild afternoons on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiest of sunsets. Or to choose a wholly unsubstantial instance purely addressed to the fancy, why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does, quote, the tall pale man of the heart's forest, whose changeless pallor unrestingly glides through the green of the groves, why is this phantom more terrible than all the whooping imps, whooping imps of the Blocksburg? Okay, so the heart's forest in the center of Germany apparently had a folk tale about this guy called the tall pale man versus this story, um, the competing folk story about demons in the other um, mountain range called Brocken as apparently not as scary, according to Melville. Nor is it altogether the remembrance of her cathedral toppling earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the terrorlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her wild, wide field of leaning spires, wrenched copstones, and cr crosses all adroop like canted yards of anchored fleets, and her suburban avenues of house walls lying up over upon each other as a tossed pack of cards. It is not these things alone which make tearless Lima the strangest, saddest city thou can't see. So Lima is the capital of Peru, and he's saying that the white stones used to build this city are what make it sad, not the fact that it is uh, vulnerable to earthquakes and to heat and to everything else that Lima has. For Lima has taken the white veil, and there is higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, the conqueror of Peru, uh, this whiteness keeps her ruins forever new, admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts the rigid pallor of an apoplexy that fixes its own distortion. So uh, Melville says, it would be better, it would be less scary if Lima were completely run down because then you would have green vegetation than to just have the empty whiteness of its uh, buildings. Okay, now let's skip down to where it says second. I think what's interesting here is that Melville is going to compare how white can mean different things to different people, which he's been doing the whole time by giving the counter examples, but he's going to get even more explicit in comparing the Peruvian to the sailor. And he says second, to the native Indian of Peru, the continual sight of the snow, snow howdud, I, I guess that's an archaic term that means piled with, uh, 
Andes conveys naught of dread, except perhaps in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning of, at such vast altitudes, and the natural conceit of what a fearfulness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitudes. So he says, okay, snow on mountains is generally a good thing, right? We find it beautiful. Much the same as it would be with the backwoodsmen of the West, who with comparative indifference views an unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow, no shadow of a tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness. So if any of you have ever lived in the Midwest like I have, it's pretty cool when you see fresh snow out on the beautiful plains. But that's to two different people compared to the sailor who sees things differently. Not so the sailor, beholding the scenery of the Antarctic seas, where at times, by some infernal trick of leisure domain, in the powers of frost and air, he shivering and half shipwrecked instead of rainbows, speaking hope and solace to his misery, views what seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him with lean ice monuments and splintered crosses. Sorry, I forgot to turn the page there. So, uh, obviously... If the meaning of something can change based on the perspectives of different people, then that meaning has to be contingent, right? Something that we would say is inherently true or not up for human debate, I guess an example I'll give would be gravity, right? It would be absurd to say, you know what, from my perspective, gravity isn't true. It doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't work like that. In fact, it's very easy to find scientific facts which are objective and seem inherent to the nature of the universe as opposed to contingent, right? However, for other things, contingent thought obviously makes more sense, right? Like, I like pineapple on pizza. That's a contingent thought. That's, there's nothing inherent about pineapple, which has to be good. It's from my perspective. But the fact that whiteness changes based on whether you're a sailor or whether you're a Peruvian seems to call into question the inherent nature of its meaning. Okay. You've stuck with me thus far. I like going through all those different examples uh, in order to demonstrate just how well read and how interesting Melville's writing is with its constant allusions to other things. But this last chapter really summarizes uh, Melville's conclusions on the question, or perhaps the ultimate implication of this meditation on whiteness. So let's read the first part. Ishmael considers, in the end, is it that by its indefiniteness, the fact that white does not have a clear inherent meaning, is it by its indefiniteness it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe, and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that as in essence whiteness is not so much a color as the visible absence of color, and at the same time the concrete of all colors, is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless all color of atheism from which we shrink. So if you're curious how I get to elevate this discussion of just the meaning of whiteness to the meaning of meaning, it's this paragraph where Ishmael takes the discussion that's been happening the whole chapter and explicitly names it in the context of whether things have meaning at all. And in that first passage I just read, it seems to argue that the ultimate conclusion of the chapter is paradox. And the two paradoxes that we get is dumb blankness full of meaning and colorless all color paradox. The real reason that this passage considers as to why whiteness is terrifying is because of the very difficulty in answering the question, what does white mean? The problem is the question itself, is there inherent meaning to whiteness, might not have an answer because meaning things might just be a human invention, i.e. white is the color of atheism, that white can mean what you want it to mean. And this is associated with atheism, right? Because religious thought is inherent. Religious thought imparts meaning to the world. But if why white is terrifying is because it forces us to do the very same thinking that Melville does in the first part of the chapter, then it is the color of atheism which shakes us from our belief in inherent meaning due to its colorlessness, okay? 
This is then added to or considered in a different metaphor that is even more, I think, revealing in the second part. When we consider that other theory of the natural philosopher, so he's talking about some scientific theory, that all other earthly hues, either every <coughs> stately or loving emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, and the gilded velvets of butterflies, and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtile deceits, okay, deceptions. Not actually inherent in substances. Ooh, there you go. Thanks for playing. If you thought Mr. D was just making all this crap up, there's the word inherent. Not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without. So that all deified nature absolutely paints like a harlot. Okay, let's explain. So Ishmael then applies this possible emptiness not only to white objects, right? This whole chapter, we've been talking about different things that are white, robes and whales and sharks and bears. But he starts to make a clever play on the literal element of whiteness being the basis for all color, right? Like if you, ref if you refract white light, it contains all colors within it. So everything that has figurative color, which of course figurative color here is meaning, Everything that we think has meaning is really just a refraction or a perversion of the true white colorlessness, thus figurative meaninglessness, of the world. I.e., when we say that a pink butterfly has color, we are simply misinterpreting a reflection of light that looks to us as pink, but if we were to find its true nature would ultimately be white light, i.e. light that is empty, i.e. meaningless. When we say something has meaning, we, according to this passage, not according to me, not even necessarily according to Melville, but according to this passage, we are simply misinterpreting the empty white meaninglessness of the world. That there is not actually inherent anything inherent in those substances, but it is only laid on from without. Now we get to his next metaphor. So that all deified nature, all the parts of nature that we find cool and interesting and deified, i.e. worshipped and regarded or treated as a god, it paints like a harlot. A harlot is a prostitute, okay? And in ancient times, harlots and whores and prostitutes were associated with painting because they would use thick coats of paint to hide the signs of their STDs, okay? So the painted harlot is an image of deception. And the color that we see in things, the meaning we see in things might just be a deception. And our brain is the metaphorical harlot. Whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel house within. I hope we get a definition for charnel house. We don't. It means essentially a graveyard or place where bones are stored. So though the meaning that we see on things makes us think that there is something good within, what is truly within all things is a metaphorical emptiness, which Melville captures with the idea of empty bones. And when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colorless in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge. So that's exactly what I just described, right? That ultimately all the light that strikes even things we consider beautiful, like tulips and roses, is actually empty. Pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us like a leper. If we were to think about this, then the universe seems palsied, paralyzed, right? Incapacitated, helpless, empty. And it lies before us like a leper, someone who is weak and vulnerable. Because now the universe has gone from beautiful and full of deified nature to being a charnel house. That the universe is just empty, there is no meaning to what we're doing, there's no meaning to anything except what we project onto the world. And like willful travelers in Lapland who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. So that's the final metaphor of the chapter. So if we stare at this universe that is empty, we are like travelers in Lapland, which is an archaic way to say northern Europe, i.e. Sweden, Norway, etc., uh, where if you don't wear colored glasses on your eyes, the light will reflect off all the snow and ice so strongly that it could blind you. 
So the ultimate warning of the chapter is that perhaps the world is empty and it does lie before us like a leper, but perhaps the reason why people don't think like that is that perhaps you'll be blinded, i.e. debilitated, by your belief that there is no meaning. So, once again, I want to state explicitly, this is not necessarily my view. This is not necessarily Melville's view. I am simply explaining what chapter 42 in the text seems to argue. Okay? Now, one last thing. Of course, anyone who has read up to this point should immediately be thinking to themselves, Oh my God, this is in direct contrast to Ahab's theories from chapter 36 and chapter 41. Ahab thinks the world is chock full of meaning, right? That he, in fact... He, he thinks that meaning is hiding behind everything. That intentionality is the basis of existence. Everything has willfulness, right? The, the shark that tries to eat you has will. And I have will. Ishmael, on the other hand, in this chapter, seems to consider that the whiteness of the whale is horrifying for the very opposite reason. That there is no divine god or importance to Moby Dick. It's just a whale. But which one is worse? Being part of a universe where things are intentional and, and the, the meaning is, a, a, is the product of divine plan, right? Maybe that the meaning of Moby Dick is that God is trying to punish Ahab for his pride or of human invention, right? If I fight with someone, I'm part of a universe where I'm struggling with another person who's trying to exert his influence upon the world. And both of those things that could create meaning, human thought or divine plans, can be hostile, like Moby Dick seems, is that better or worse than thinking that human and animal interactions are ultimately as meaningless and empty as a white canvas, and that the meanings that we see, we are projecting onto them in the same way that when we see the pink butterfly, we are just failing to see the truly white light that strikes the butterfly, and our eyes, in an incorrect assumption, only see the pink wavelength, but fail to see the true emptiness of the light that strikes that butterfly. Good question. And you should think to yourself, which one do I think is more correct? Ahab's belief that meaning is perhaps everywhere, that we need to strike through the pasteboard mask and find the meaning that is hidden behind the veil of the animal emptiness and the brute force of a whale and life? Or is the meaning the illusion? And we need to strike through the illusion of meaning to find the emptiness that lies behind things. If chapter 36 represents the first view, chapter 42 presents the latter view. Which one is more correct? Good luck. <laughs>